about today in our message. The church, we're going to define the church. If you have your Bibles, and you should, turn with me to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, in your Bibles, we're going to read the text in a moment. Last Sunday, I stood in this pulpit, and my voice was, was shredded. And uh, I didn't feel good. I was coughing and things, and several of you were concerned about that. I woke up Monday morning, and I couldn't taste anything or smell anything. You know what that is a symptom of, right? And so on Monday, I went and got a rapid test, and I'm happy to report to you that I am zero for seven. Zero positive tests for one for seven tries. Uh, Instead of saying zero for seven, I should say I'm seven and oh. That's what I should say. I'm seven and oh. Seven negative tests, no positive. Undefeated. I'm undefeated. <laughs> uh, you know, it's funny because uh, uh, <laughs> I couldn't taste or smell anything. Turns out when your nose is plugged up, you can't smell or taste anything. You know, turns, I don't know if you've noticed that or know that, but I, I do now. Uh, so anyway, I'm back. I'm feeling stronger. My voice is good. I'm going to give it to you. Are you ready for the Word of God today? One of the biggest lies that our culture tells us today is that we as Christians fall for, that we as Christians fall for, is that faith is a private matter. Now let me say that again, because I feel like some of, our, some of us didn't, didn't get it, didn't catch it. Maybe, you're, uh, maybe you heard it and you're like, I don't know if I agree with that. I do that a lot. Before I say amen, I want to make sure I agree with. One of the biggest lies that our culture tells us today and that we as Christians fall for is that faith is a private matter. It's not. I know that offends some people. Because some people have bought that lie. The lie that says my faith is my business alone. (laughs) But I want to tell you something, friends. The Bible teaches something quite different. The biblical pattern is that spiritual rebirth results not in private believing, but rather in public belonging. Let me say that again. The biblical pattern is that spiritual rebirth results not in private believing, but rather public belonging. In other words, spiritual birth results in community. The Bible never tells us that our faith is so private that we can just be a private Christian, a closeted Christian. In Acts chapter 2, we see that 120 individual believers assembled in the upper room practicing their private faith, and suddenly the Holy Spirit falls. Now, That 120 becomes 3,120 in one day. The church goes from being a loose bunch of followers of Christ into a tightly bound body of Christ. They move beyond simple belief and, and something quite extraordinary is born. And let me remind you and in fact warn you that it takes more than simple belief to get into heaven. The Bible says that demons believe and tremble. They're not going to heaven. In fact, they're going to go to the lake of fire. So it takes something more than simple belief to make it to heaven. I believe it takes believing and belonging. Believing and belonging. Your faith, let me say it again, in case you want to argue with me about it, and I'm welcome, I welcome any argument. Your faith is not a private matter. It's not a private matter. Despite what some people in our culture want to tell you. Your faith is not a private matter. If you live by the Bible, when you come to faith in Christ, you join a community, and and it's not a private matter. Stand with me if you wouldn't. Let's read our scripture text today. I want this text to show you the truth of the statement I just made. I do not make this statement and then find scripture to proof text it. This proof comes out of this text, Acts chapter 2. Verses 42 through 47. Understand the Holy Spirit just fell. 
The windows of the upper room blew open and a rushing mighty wind blew in there. The Holy Spirit came in and cloven tongues of fire rested on their head and they spoke with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. The day of Pentecost came and these are the words that follow immediately Peter's message on the day of Pentecost. And here's the pattern of the earliest church. Verse 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. And all the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in the homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Before I pray, let me ask you a question. Does that sound like a private faith? Does that sound like they practice a faith in privacy? No, they were together, they were in the temple courts, they met together, they broke bread together. I mean, they were together, they enjoyed the favor of all the people, they practiced their faith publicly. It's not a private matter. When they came to Christ and the Holy Spirit fell, they took their faith public. Let's pray. Father, bless this word to our, our hearing today and to our understanding, and I pray that you'd motivate us, God, with your opinion, not the opinion of man, and may we be changed By your word, in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Today's message is titled, Believing and Belonging. Believing and Belonging. Now, many people today are leery of the church. When skeptics and atheists want to argue against the existence of God, quite often they point to the historical atrocities perpetrated on innocent people by the church. It's often true in Quite embarrassing. It is impossible to defend the fact that the church has had more, some horribly violent times in the past. It has come off the rails historically at times. For instance, the medieval crusades, which took place between the years 1095 and 1272 AD, killed thousands of Jewish people and Muslims, or what the church at that time called infidels, in the name of God. In 1478 AD, the church sanctioned sanctioned what has come to be called the Spanish Inquisition. Unbelievers and the misunderstood were tortured, maimed, and killed by the thousands as the church attempted to purify itself of so-called heretics and apostates. These were bad times. Even in the year 1692, on our own continent of North America, the Salem witch trials took place. Dozens of women and men were convicted and executed by a religious court in a paranoid attempt to purge occult practices from its midst. Consequently, dozens of innocent people were accused and 19 people were hanged to death. And now, our lexicon contains the term witch hunt. All because of what happened in the year 1692 in North America. Today, today there are many who call themselves progressive Christians or deconstructionists who are leaving or remaining outside of the church and luring others away who are disenchanted, accusing the church of being led by and filled with judgmental, hypocritical, narrow-minded, homophobic legalists. An alarming number of young adults are finding themselves in this camp and they see church as, an irre- as irrelevant to their lives. Or they seek to reform and redefine its doctrine and practice, no longer anchoring it to orthodoxy or a literal interpretation of the Bible. Many of these have been hurt or disillusioned by the church. And I can tell you that even pastors get hurt by people in the church. One Sunday morning, a pastor got up in the pulpit and apologized for the Band-Aid on his face. He said, I was thinking about my sermon while shaving and I cut my face. 
Afterwards, he found a note in the offering plate. It said, next time, think about your face and cut your sermon. (laughs) It's a joke. Maybe not a funny one, but a joke nonetheless. Philip Yancey in his book called Church, Why Bother? Can you imagine writing a book, Church, Why Bother? (laughs) opens up with a quote from J.F. Powers that I think is powerful. It says, again, I quote from Yancey's book called Church, Why Bother? This is a big old ship, Bill. She creaks, she rocks, she rolls, and at times she makes you want to throw up. (laughs) But she gets you where she's going, always has, always will, until the end of time with or without you. I love that quote. I love that quote. I can't think of a more true quote for the church. It's a big old ship. She creaks, she rocks, she rolls, and at times she makes you want to throw up. But she gets you where she's going. Always has, always will, to the end of time, with or without you. Today I want to examine. We've looked down through history at some of the atrocities when the church has come off the rails but today, I want to go back to the beginning. What, is, what was the church meant to be at the beginning? When the church first started, the earliest form of the church. I want to go back then and, and, and see how they did church. What characterized them? And perhaps we can learn something today as we attempt to be the church in a contemporary context. So I want to look at this message this morning in three sections. First, I want to answer some questions some frequently asked questions, some facts about church. Three frequently asked questions about church. Let me answer these quickly and move on to the second point. Number one, the first frequently asked question, what is church? (laughs) What is church? Define for us what church is. Well, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2, Paul gives us a great twofold definition of church. A great twofold definition of church. He says, and I quote, to the church of God in Corinth, the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be his holy people, there you go, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be his holy people, together with all those everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Okay, two full definition of the church Paul is giving us there. Here it is, number one, he is defining the church as a church. A local body of believing participant Christians. A a local body of believing and participating Christians. The Corinthians, he notes, were a church. They were the saved and sanctified. A church. So the first definition is there's a church. And secondly, there's the church. What is the church? Paul describes this as the, like the universal body of believing and participating Christians. In other words, he says, all those everywhere who call on the name. All those everywhere. In other words, the universal church. So you, Corinthians, in your local church, as well as everyone everywhere who calls on the name of the Lord. That's the church. A church and the church. A local body of believing and participating Christians. A universal body of believing and participating Christians. Uh, Christians. The church, as we note in this definition, is not a building. Although the earliest church met in the temple courts, they met in a building, and they, in our text tells us they met in houses. They did meet in buildings, but they were not a building. They were a body. The church is not a building, it's a body. The church is an organism, not an organization. Can I tell you, as a pastor, I spend much of my time trying to organize this organism. (laughs) I spend day and night, I worry about it when I'm at home and when I'm sleeping, when I get up in the morning. How am I going to organize? How am I going to herd this? How am I going to herd this bunch of cats? You ever tried to herd cats? Organizing a, a church is like herding cats. Everybody's going off in their different directions. difficult. And I need to remind myself from time to time, the church is an organism. It's, a, it's living. It's not a dead organization. It's a body, a living body, not a building. 
Can I just tell you, we're renovating our building, not because our building is a sanctuary. In fact, we took the word sanctuary off this building. We put auditorium. This is a tool. This is a building where the body meets. That's all it's ever going to be. Now, we want it to be a, a good place. We want it to be a steady place. We want it to not have mold and dirt, and we want it to be functional. So we're, we're going to make it into the best building we can. Why? Because that's where the body meets. But it, the church is a body, not a building. It's an organism, not an organization. Paul puts it this way in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. Look at this. For we were all baptized by one spirit so to form one body. One spirit to form one body. Whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, he could have said male or female, and we're all given one spirit to drink. One body. The church is an organism. The church is a body, not a building, and not an organization. So... That's the first question, what is church? It's a local assembly, a local body of believing and participating Christians and the universal body. Second oft-asked question, wasn't the idea of church man-made? I get asked this a lot. In fact, I rarely get asked it, I get told it by people. After all, the church was man's idea, not God's. A bunch of people got together and thought, how can we get money from people and get rich? I know, we'll make an organization, we'll stand up and we'll ask people to tithe and give money and get rich. There is this accusation among people who don't understand the church, don't understand the Bible, don't understand God, that the church is a man-made organization. I want to remind you today that the Bible says it's not a man-made organization for two reasons. Number one, Jesus founded it. The church is not man-made. Jesus founded it. It was his idea. Did you know that? Did you know the church was Jesus' idea? In Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, he says, I will build my church. Whose church is it? It's my church. Do you know that sometimes when I get tired, sometimes when I get angry, sometimes when I get disturbed, sometimes when I get, you know, when I'm at the end of my strength, God has to remind me, it's not your church. What? It's my church. Tiffany Fellowship is Jesus' church. He's the head of this church. I may be the lead pastor, but he's the head of this church. And sometimes he has to tell me in strong terms, it's not your church, so back off. Oh, Sometimes the Lord says, it's not your church. Go on vacation. What? Yeah. Take a breath. Everything's going to be okay. The church was Jesus' idea. Think about that for a second. That should blow up some of our brains. Because we can ignore a man-made idea, right? This man-made idea, I can ignore that. But it's, this is Jesus' idea. He founded it. It's his idea. He made it. Secondly, Jesus died for it. And the Scripture tells us he remains active in his church. He founded it. He died for it. And he's active in it today. Look at Ephesians chapter 5, 25 through 27. Let this scripture speak to your heart. Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. For who? The church. I thought he died for me. Yeah, he died for you as part of the church. He died for the church. Look at this. To make her holy. Cleansing her. Continues to cleanse her by the washing ING, a continuous washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish but holy and blameless. Jesus died for his church and he is active in his church. It's not man's idea, it's God's idea. Listen, you're, you're a part of a church that was founded by Jesus Christ. And he's still active here. In fact, the scripture says when two or more of you in the body get together, I am there. I'm there. Whoa. Question number three. Can I be a Christian and not be a part of a local church? <laughs> I, get, 
I get asked this question all the time. I have to answer this question all the time. Here's, what I'm, here's how I'm going to answer it today. I'm going to read some scripture, and then I'll answer the question. And perhaps as I read through these scriptures right from the Bible, you will be able to answer this for yourself. Can I be a Christian and not be a part of a local church? First of all, we are warned to keep meeting together. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Do not stop meeting together. Notice that word, together. Now those of you who are joining us online today, we are gathered together by live stream. I don't want you to feel any less a part of this. It may not be ideal, But when you gather with us, and it's important for you to interact with us, to be with us, to stay in contact with us, because you're a part, we gather online. The pandemic has caused us us to break out of the walls and be different, but we're still meeting together. You know what, let me just pause and say this. I think sometime the pandemic has caused us to be less of a church, when as we see the day approach, we need to be more the church. Not less, more. Well, you know, because guess, guess what? Listen, everybody thinks the pandemic, it, the pandemic is an excuse for everything. The supply chain is broke. Why? Pandemic. I went to a restaurant this week. I went to Culver's. I like Culver's because uh, Culver's is the headquarters in, in Wisconsin. Culver's is in Wisconsin. The cheese they have there is from Wisconsin. Culver's is all about Wisconsin. So I went there and I said, hey, I want some cheese curds, some Wisconsin cheese curds. She said, we don't have them. I said, why? It's still on your menu. Well, we don't have them right now. Why? Because of supply problems. Supply problems, yeah, the pandemic. Oh, We're taking bids on construction for phase two and phase three, and some of our contractors are coming back and saying, we'll bid this price for this particular project, but understand, we might not have the workforce, we might not be able to get the supplies right away. Why? Because of the pandemic. I'm out of a job because of the pandemic. I can't tithe because of the pandemic. I I have to leave my wife, why? Because of the pandemic. Let me tell you something. We don't stop being the church because of the pandemic. We need to be the church even more because of the pandemic. We're warned to keep meeting together. Secondly, we are encouraged to devote ourselves to one another. Romans 15, 7, accept one another, then just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. Accept one another. Romans 10, or 12, 10, be devoted. Boy, not, now, now we don't have to accept. Not only have to accept, we have to be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor each other above yourselves. Whoa. Three, we are instructed to be in unity. 1 Corinthians 12, 25, there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. We should be equally concerned for each other. There should be no division in the body. Fourth, we are expected to help equip and mature the church with our giftedness. Let me give you two scripture verses for this one. Ephesians 4, 11 and 12. Look at this. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers to equip his people for works of service. Now look at this next phrase. So that the body of Christ, what is another word for the body of Christ? The church can be built up. Whoa. Whoa. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 28. And God has placed, where? Read it. Say it out loud. In the church. What? Yeah. Where has God placed the gifts? In the church. 
First of all, apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, of helping and guidance, and on and on and on the gifts go. Where has God placed them? In the church. God gives gifts to the church, leadership gifts and motivational gifts. We have a class coming up, by the way. If you don't know what your giftedness is, we're going to help you find out. Sign up for that class. Dr. Frank Armato will be teaching it. Now let me answer the question. Can I be a Christian and not be a part of a local church? Here's the conclusion. If one is a part of the universal church, one must be a part of the local church. You can't be a part of one and not the other. The answer is no. You cannot be a Christian and not be a part of a local church. You, oh, I'm a part of the universal church, but not a local. Listen, it doesn't work this way. Let me just remind you. How can we meet together? How can we encourage and be devoted to one another? How can we be in unity? How can we use our giftedness unless we're a part of a local church? How can it happen? It can't. It just can't. And if you hold to that theory, you hold an anti-biblical theory. The church was Jesus' idea. He founded it. He's still active in it, and he wants our active participation in it. Paul says, all of the people who name the name, that's me, I'm a part of a universal church. No, you're part of the local church too. If you're saved, You're a part of a local church. D.L. Moody was visiting a prominent Christian citizen. This is back in the days when Moody Bible Institute was just beginning and when D.L. Moody was a famous, very famous evangelist who led many people and pastored a huge church in Chicago. D.L. Moody was visiting a prominent Chicago citizen when the idea of church involvement came up. I believe I can be just as good a Christian outside the church as I can be inside of it, the man said. Moody said nothing. Instead, he moved to the fireplace, blazing against the winter outside, removed one burning coal and placed it on the hearth. The two men sat together and watched the ember die out. I see, the man said. Listen, together we burn bright. Alone we burn out. Here's the whole crux of this message today. Together we burn bright. Alone we burn out. It was never intended for a Christian to be a Christian privately. That's not the way Jesus intended it when he created it. All right, those are three frequently asked questions. Now, let us turn our attention toward the earliest pattern of the church. Let's, let's look at how it was at the beginning. Let's learn what it was. You know, the church went off the rails through history, the Spanish Inquisition, the Crusades, you know, the witch hunts. They've gone off the track. So let's go all the way back to the beginning and let's look at the earliest pattern of the church and let's learn some lessons for us today. And I want to, I want to just show you two things about the pattern of the earliest church. Number one, they practiced uncommon devotion together. They practiced uncommon devotion together. Look at our text, verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles, teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And then verse 44, look at this togetherness. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They practiced uncommon devotion together. Now what does devotion mean? Well, according to Richard N. Longendecker, the verb translated devoted, and I have the Greek word here on the page, but I'm not gonna gonna give it to you because I'm not sure I can pronounce it correctly. But he says the verb translated devotion in the original language connotes a steadfast and single-minded fidelity to a certain course 
of action. The New Testament word translated devotion means a steadfast and single-minded fidelity to a certain course of action. In other words, devotion then falls just short of obsession. The pattern of the early church is they were uncommonly devoted, just short of obsessed with being together, being the church, and being together. Obsessed, just about. Let me point out some things that they were together in. According to the scripture, they were uncommonly devoted, number one, to they were together in learning the word. Now, I wish I could tell you that the apostles were still alive and that we could hear them in person. But we have. In our possession and in our hands this morning, the apostles' teaching is the collection of teachings that became the New Testament. They were absolutely and uncommonly devoted to the teachings that would later become the New Testament, the apostles' teaching. They were obsessed with, with teaching and learning the Word of God together. Now I know that we're in, a, we're in a culture today where a lot of people are doing remote learning and private learning. I have a degree, I finished my degree by doing a lot of online and alone learning. And let me tell you something, I had to supplement it with in-classroom learning. Why? We learn best when we learn together. We learn best when we learn together. They had an uncommon devotion to be to learning the word of God together. Secondly, they were together in spiritual experiences. This word is, is, is called fellowship. It comes from the original Greek word. Pastor Barry, you're doing a lot of Greek today. Yes, I'm doing a lot of Greek today. Koinonia, you ever heard that term? How many of you heard that term, koinonia? That's the Greek word for fellowship in this text. More often than not, when you see the word fellowship in the New Testament, it comes from that Greek word koinonia. And it's, it, we, inter, we translate it fellowship, but we really don't have an, a good English word. We don't have a good English word to represent the word koinonia. It's, it's fellowship on a different level than we most often experience. Paul puts it this way when he talks about fellowship. He says, the fellowship of his suffering. Whoa. That's deep fellowship. The fellowship of the suffering of Jesus. I want to understand. I want a koinonia. I want to have a spiritual experience of suffering with Christ. That's deep fellowship. R. Kent Hughes, to help us understand this, in his commentary writes, and I quote, fellowship costs something in the early church. In contrast to our use of the word fellowship today, fellowship or koinonia is not just a sentimental feeling of oneness. It's not about punch and cookies meeting in the fellowship hall. Fellowship comes through giving. True fellowship costs. So many people never know the joy of Christian fellowship because they have never learned to give themselves away. To give themselves away. What does our culture say? Don't give away. Hoard. Hoard your life. Hoard your resources. Hoard your time. Hoard everything. But Christian fellowship, they devoted themselves to giving their lives away to each other. Whoa. Third, they were together in celebration of the Lord's Supper. Worship services, worship and communion, uncommonly devoted. The early church knew what it meant to proclaim the Lord's death. Do you know what they would do? They would, they would bring food to the temple courts where you could eat outside the sanctuary, and they would celebrate the Lord's Supper together in community, in public. Why? Because the meal that they were celebrating was a gospel meal, a love feast. 
And the Bible says people looked at them and they enjoyed the favor of the people and the Lord added to their number every day those who were being saved. Why? Because they were devoted to the celebration of the Lord's Supper. That brings me to number four, together in corporate prayer. See, today we think of prayer as something we do in private, in our prayer closet. But the early church devoted themselves to public and corporate prayer. They prayed together. They understood Jesus' words when he said, when any two of you agree on earth as touching one thing, it shall be done. They devoted themselves to public prayer. They prayed together, and that's why miracles happened in the early church much more than they happen today because they were praying and believing and expecting God to answer together. Today in the healing rooms, you will have an opportunity to pray together with us at the conclusion of the service. Pray together. The women's ministry runs a prayer time on Thursdays. There's plenty of of opportunities for you to pray together with us, but many of us, we're like, prayer's a private matter. I pray at home. Let me just say straight out. No, you don't. No, you don't. You might say a prayer over a meal. You might say a prayer with your spouse. You might say a prayer with your children. But I'm talking about a prayer meeting where people come together and they call on the name of the Lord. They call out in repentance and they call out on God to send revival. They call out on God to meet the needs of the people around them. They agree together and they pray together. And you read in the book of Acts and you'll find out when the church got together and prayed together, stuff happened. Peter gets let out of prison. (laughs) Comes in the middle of a prayer meeting. She's like, what are you doing here? We're in there praying for you. And Peter's like, I'm out. So, they practiced, that's the first thing I want to identify, is the earliest pattern of the church. They practiced on common devotion together. And secondly, they enjoyed supernatural results. Here's the point. When you practice uncommon devotion, you will experience supernatural results. Let's look at this, Acts chapter 2, verse 43 through 47. Look at this. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together, hello, and had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. When they practiced uncommon devotion together, they enjoyed supernatural results and miracles. Let's look at it. Let's just list the supernatural that came as a result of their devotion. Cynthia, why don't you just go ahead and put them all up there very quickly. This scripture verses tell us that there was a reverent awe, a phobos, Again, the Greek word, phobos. There was an awe, a fear, a reverence for God. From which the, phobos, from which we get the word fear. There was no skepticism, no doubt, no unbelief, no argument. There was, they were awestruck. The early church was awestruck. Why? Their devotion resulted in supernatural results. Secondly, Supernatural miracles happen. Healing, deliverance, restoration, freedom. The, this scripture text says many wonders and miraculous signs were performed. Third, sacrificial sharing. Now I'm not talking about communism. I'm not talking about socialism. A lot of people think they were demanded to sell everything. No, they weren't. The story of Ananias and Sapphira, God didn't kill them because they didn't give. God destroyed them and killed them because they didn't, they were, they lied to the Holy Spirit. You didn't have to sell everything. People did it when they saw a need. They would sell things to provide for the need. And Ananias and Sapphira said, we're going to give this piece of property to God. And they lied. They kept some back from themselves. 
I'm not talking about communism or socialism. We're talking about some kind of uncommon sharing of responsibility for people. Sacrificial sharing. Fourth, they were united in corporate worship. They met in the temple. They met in homes together. They had sincere hearts. They were taking you know, communion together. Unified in corporate worship. And number five, evangelism happened. They had favor with all the people. And the church growed. The scripture says God added to the church daily those who were being saved. Now let me give you a simple phrase to describe what happened when the church practiced uncommon devotion. Spiritual momentum. So that's the earliest pattern of the church. Now, I want to conclude this morning by asking some questions of application. What can we learn? How can we apply this pattern of the earliest church? How can we apply their pattern? How can we live out the definition of what the early church and what our church is supposed to be? Let me ask it. You answer, not vocally, but rhetorically in your spirit. Let's ask ourselves four questions. Number one, have I added belonging to my believing? Ask yourself that question. Have I added belonging to my believing? Do I belong to a small group? Do I belong to a prayer group? Do I belong in a ministry in the church? Do I belong to a service in my community of believers? Do I belong as well as believe? Friends, this is crucial. It's Jesus' church. He founded it. He died for it. He's still active in it. And he expects us to, give, to use our giftedness. We need to belong Ask and answer that. Number two, do I have deep relationships in the church? I'm going to ask the musicians to come as we get ready to conclude this. Do I have deep relationship in the church? <laughs> ask yourself this question. Do I even like church people? Do I even like church people? Almost late for church one day, a wife said to her husband, shouldn't we be leaving for church now? He said, I'm not going to church today. Nobody at that church likes me, and I don't like any of them. She replied, you have to go. You're the pastor. <laughs> uh, you know what makes that story funny to me? <laughs> Sometimes I can't make anyone happy. It's difficult to make the staff happy, difficult to make the congregation happy, difficult to make the elders happy. Sometimes I go home frustrated, I can't make anyone happy. Do you have any relationships in the church, or do you reserve your most intimate, most important relationships to people outside the church? Number three, how devoted am I to practicing my giftedness? How devoted am I to practicing my giftedness? Remember, devotion is steadfast, single-minded fidelity. You are gifted by God, and he requires stewardship. Could I just tell you, I just feel impressed to make a confession to you this morning. I sometimes get so tired as the lead pastor. Jesus is the head of this church. He's the head. But as the lead pastor, sometimes I get tired of trying to fit all the pieces together. Do you know how difficult it is as the senior pastor to hear from our children's pastor, we need, we need workers take care of our children and to hear from our you know, our worship pastor we don't have sound guys we don't have people to fill in the stream one time she said to me I just want to let you know we don't have a drummer this morning
let me make a confession to you. We don't confess our weaknesses and we don't confess our needs very much because it's difficult. And I think sometimes, please understand my heart when I say this, it looks easy. From where you sit, it looks easy. And so you think, they don't need me. Look how easy. Let me say this, we need you. Do you have any idea the sheer volume of volunteers we need to make a Sunday and a Wednesday happen? And meanwhile, the vast majority of the congregation sits there and says, minister to me. I need the ministry. It's not easy and it's made harder by the fact that a lot of us are not offering our giftedness to the church to which we belong. Jesus said, I put gifts in the church. I put the giftedness in the church. And we're taking our gifts out inside the church. Inside the church? Oh boy, I've had a tough week, Pastor Mary. Pastor Emily, just sing to me. Let the band play and sing to me. I, I need to be ministered to. Oh. You're the church. You're the church. God put gifts in this church in you, and we need you. I want to thank from this moment every person that takes care of kids on Sunday morning and on Wednesday night. What a wonderful, wonderful ministry it is. Someone said to me, well, I can hold babies. We need people to hold babies. Once you get a background check, <laughs> get properly trained. For this church to function and for this church to be what God wants it to be in the future, God forbid that he take me out of here. I feel called to this place. I'd die in this pulpit if I have to. But God forbid that we don't offer our giftedness to the body to which we belong. I believe with all my heart, many of us are going to be accountable for that. I think I'm going to be accountable because I did things that weren't my job to do, you know? I sweat about that stream. We, we try to provide a video stream of the highest quality, and I just sweat about that so much, and oh, sweat about that so much. And I just, that doesn't need to be my job. How devoted am I to practicing my giftedness? You're gifted by God, and he requires stewardship. Finally, can someone outside the faith look at my life and decide to become a Christian? See, the earliest church, they enjoyed the favor of all the people. Why? Because people watched them. They watched how they worshiped God. They watched how they met together. They watched how they sang. They watched how they taught and learned together. They watched how they celebrated the Lord's Supper together. They watched how they prayed together. And the Lord added to their number every day those who were being saved because people were like, I want to be a part of that group. So can someone outside the faith look at your life and decide to become a Christian? Perhaps someone wouldn't even know you are a Christian by looking at your life. Will you stand with me and let's pray. Let's close in prayer. I'm going to ask our elders and prayer partners to come. We want to pray with you for anything you have need of in this moment. Emily, uh, the worship team is going to sing a song for us as we close this service in prayer.
when I finish praying, we're going to sing a song, but you can be dismissed to pick up your kids or whatever. Lord God, we acknowledge that Jesus is the creator of the church. It was his idea, and he is still active in it. We thank you for the church. We know that when we were saved and became a part of the universal church, we are called to unity and to full participation, not only in the universal church, but in the local church. And we repent of our attempts to keep our faith private. We repent, Lord, of our attempts to be closeted Christians. Help us, Lord, to practice the pattern of the earliest church Help us to be devoted to your word, to corporate fellowship, to celebrating the Lord's Supper in community, and to prayer. Reveal to us our unique giftedness and give us the will and energy to take our place and accept our responsibility in the church. May we be a people who not only believe but belong. Inspire us again with your calling and a vision of what you want to do through us, your church in the Northland of Kansas City, the state of Missouri, the United States of America, and around the world. Where we are your church, called by your name and empowered by your spirit to be your body in this world until you return. And we pray this in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Come if you need prayer.